they're teaching coaches, teaching coaches how to coach, right? No, what's happening is they're marketing people, teaching coaches how to market, not how to be a better coach, not how to get more people to completion. They don't know instructional design. They don't understand. They're just like, you just need to sell a course. And my course on teaching you how to sell a course is going to help you sell a course. Welcome to Marketing Muckraking, the show that asks not simply what brand culture can do for us, but what it's doing to us. With your host, creative director and brand strategist gone wild, Rachel K. Albers, making fun of business and making business fun. This is the show for rebels, revolutionaries, and renegades who run businesses that burn the rule book. If you're sick of business podcasts that have all the answers, well, I got nothing but questions. Let's go. Episode 25, From Thomas Edison to Tony Robbins, The Online Business Family Tree, Part 1. You are in for a wild ride because I am joined by my guest, Lisa Robin Young, for a four-part series on the online business family tree, where we trace back how we arrived at this moment in internet marketing and online business and who are the key leaders who brought us here? Starting with Ben Franklin, Henry Ford, and Thomas Edison, all the way to Tony Robbins, Marie Forleo, Jenna Kutcher, Russell Brunson, Brooke Castillo, and Matthew McConaughey? Yeah, he's a life coach now. If you don't know or care about these names, never fear. We focus on what tactics these leaders popularized and how they've invaded nearly every celebrity online business course, including Matthew McConaughey's. This series is foundational in understanding the evolution, not only of online business and marketing, but many of the advertising principles that we have come to take for granted is just how it's done. But as we say on the show, this stuff didn't start on the internet. It goes back hundreds of years. To understand marketing history is to understand ourselves and our culture. Marketing is the fuel for the engine of capitalism. So let's take a trip through time so you can be a more informed consumer and hopefully a more ethical marketer. But before we get started, a little about my guest. Lisa Robin Young has 30 years of business experience as a coach and creative entrepreneur. She is an award-winning speaker, a best-selling author, and accomplished musician with multiple albums to her credit. You may even recognize her from the Disney Plus show Encore. She is also the host of the Creative Freedom Show, and I highly recommend her music video parodies. Check out There Are Worse Things I Could Do for a Marie Forleo crossover with Awkward Marketing. Lisa specializes in helping creative entrepreneurs build a business that works for how you're wired to work. Now let's meet Lisa and let's get on with the show. Lisa Robin Young, I am so thrilled to have you here with us today. What an honor to be co-muckraking with you. Hi, how are you? I'm good. I'm I'm really excited. And the honor truly is mine. Like, you know, I have stalked you for a very long time and I adore you. So I really appreciate the opportunity to get all historical up in here. Yes, we're co-muckraking. We're burning shit down. We're lighting a way to a better future. That's what I'm hoping that we're doing today as we talk about the online business or internet marketing family tree. Although honestly, not to clickbait people here, but I feel like it's more of like a family circle or the tree just is one long festivist pole. It's just a <laughs> the pole tree never and branches, there's no branches. Yes. Yes. It's the online family circle jerk. Can we say that? It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty incestuous. I mean, when you really look at the whole spectrum of where some of this stuff came from, a lot of it comes from the same handful of sources that's just trickled down in different ways and moved around through different people over, you know, the decades that the internet has been around. And I mean, it has really been doing this pretty much since the beginning of the internet. And we're going to talk about all that. So yes. And the whole thing we're talking about today is it didn't just appear when MySpace did, right? right. It's not right. actually just about the World Wide Web. And that's kind of what we want to go into is how this goes back into Definitely all throughout American history, the history of business as we know it today, of modern business. We're not going back thousands of years, although we certainly could. Maybe a part three we'll do. We'll go back into <laughs> ancient times, the ancient Napoleon, the ancient Tony Robbins written on <laughs> cave walls somewhere. I believe well, it. Well, when I was researching for our call, because you come so prepared, I was like, I got I to gotta step up my game. I was looking at, you know, masterminds and we're going to have a whole conversation, but like one of the first masterminds in the United States that's, you know, recorded 
was like Ben Franklin with the Junto in like the 1700s. So I mean, this stuff's been around and it all trickles back to or trickles up to or trickles around to some very interesting players. And I'm really glad to be able to finally get some of this repressed knowledge out of my body and into the world. So yes, you are a wealth of knowledge. You have at least a decade on me in the online business game and the business game in general, because you were doing sales and marketing before it went online. Yeah, well, I built one of the first ever e-commerce websites like in 1994. So it's been almost 30 years. And we were still taking money orders by mail when PayPal came onto the scene. So it's been a long time. I'm that kid, you know, in high school who could be in every room and nobody paid any attention to me for the most part. Like I was the good little girl. Oh, we can do stuff. And she's never going to say anything because she's the good girl. And that's just carried on with me like throughout my life. So I get into these companies where these internet marketers are and I'm, you know, got my hands dirty in their business doing whatever it is that they've hired me to do. And this stuff starts coming out and I'm like, how does, how does the world not know this, right? And sometimes I've signed NDAs and sometimes I haven't. And so it's like, what do I share and what do I not share? And how do I use it ethically for myself and for my clients, right? So that's kind of the full circle, quick and dirty on 30 years in the online, in online space. We're all fortunate to have this wealth of knowledge with us today and co-muckraking with us. And you know, why does nobody know about this? That question, I think we're going to answer that question on today's show. So, okay, if we are going back through time to trace the roots of the online business internet marketing family tree to long before the internet ever existed, before we get into it, before we get into all of this juicy and troubling information, I think we should talk a little bit about why we decided to approach this topic this way and why we are choosing to name some of the names of the powerful leaders and to outline it in this format. Yeah. And I think like you, and I know you've articulated this many times, people want us to name names. Naming names comes out of a place of genuine desire to be well-informed and to not be that guy and not follow into that trap or not be ensnared by whatever the tactic is that's being employed. And you pointed this out in your pre-marketing. It's less about the bad apples and more about the idea that the whole tree is rotten. Like mm -hmm. if you really look at it, the rot runs deep. And these people, some of them are doing stuff that they've been taught by people who taught them, by people who taught them, and they don't know necessarily. And then once they get to a point where they do know, it's like, well, crap, I've built my whole business on this and it works. Uh, now I don't know how to change it because now there's a lot riding on it if I make a change and what if it fails? And so my goal is less about, I mean, we're going to call some names out, but it's more about recognizing what these things are, where they came from, so that you can see it no matter what stripes it's wearing, right? Right. Because... A tactic that was employed at the early 20th century is still being employed today. It just looks like girl bosses now instead of guys in suits camping out in the woods. And we have to recognize it's the same tactic. So for me, it's about let's know more so that we can be informed buyers and sellers so that we know what we're getting into. And then we can decide for ourselves, is that an integrity for me? Right. And if it's not, then you can choose to do differently. Yeah. And like you said, people have asked us and asked each other. It's not just us. People are always curious about, okay, you've named this tactic. You've helped to identify this or that predatory behavior or approach, but can you help me better understand who is doing this? And let me tell you, if my whole goal on the planet was just to go viral for the sake of it, then I would be creating content going person by person through this online family tree circle poll, whatever you want to call it, and just creating a video or a podcast episode on each one of them. But the reason that I felt compelled to do this with you and to outline not just the people, but the methods that they have learned and passed down to each other yeah. is because, yeah, it's not about bad apples. It is about a rotten tree and all of these folks are connected. The question might come up, well, if it's about the methods and it's about the tactics, then why are you deciding to outline some of these leaders' names? Because part of how they became influential wealthy, powerful leaders was by leveraging each other's fame and their personal yes. brands to do it. We're going to go yes. all the way back to the early masterminds and identify how that was actually part of mm -hmm. the pitch. And I yeah. think what's important for us to also note here before we head right into the muckraking is that we're not talking about these people off the clock. I'm talking about the multinational corporate entities with human faces. The, the girl boss, the boy bo boss next door, 
who has built an empire on their relatability and leveraged kind of the parasocial bonds that they have with their audiences to make money and become powerful and influential. And then when the light gets shined on their tactics and how they did that, then it's like, oops, I, I didn't even realize it. I was just, you know, here on my laptop in my living room. Or they say, don't shame me into playing small. That one really burns my toast because it's like, you're looking at these people who have exploited their approachability to make millions upon millions of dollars. We're not talking about people who are, you know, just making six figures and, and keeping the lights on and enjoying a vacation once in a while. We're talking about people who are buying multiple properties, who have lots of people in their organization, who are sometimes exploiting the people in their organization by playing money ball with them in ways that are very harmful to the people that are in those organizations. These are not solopreneurs anymore. And if if this had just been a name dropping session, I wouldn't have done it because of this thing that we're very, very much talking about. It's like the people piece, people are people, but the tactics and the leveraging and the exploitation, that's a corporate behavior. That's a corporate culture. And that's part of what makes capitalism so problematic. I still want to believe that the only way to change a system is from the inside. I know you did a whole episode on can, can capitalism be rehabilitated? I want to believe yes. And I recognize it can't if those people are still in power pretending to be these innocent people next door who are just like you. And if you can do it, we can too. And trying to sell that dream when the reality is completely different. They hustled their face off for months or years. And now they're sitting in their ivory tower saying, just be kind to people and go with the flow and trust the universe. And it's like, yeah, but you got to hustle your face off first to get there. And you're not talking about that anymore because now you've quote unquote made it. That's not fair. It's not an accurate reflection. And that's what I want to call out is that kind of behavior from these entities who appear to be solopreneur micropreneurs, right? They're corporations in girl boss clothing, corporations in people next door clothing. And we need to really be clear on that distinction. This is it. What I know that we also have in common, Lisa, is that we ourselves are business owners supporting small businesses. And my experience has been, it's almost been 15 years for me in business. I couldn't even quantify the amount of talented, brilliant people who have come my way after they got got by one yes. of these scammers, right? And yes. so they spent, you know, they mortgaged their house or they took out a credit card or they took every dime of their savings to buy into one of these programs, to go to one of these high ticket retreats or join one of these masterminds. Mm -hmm. It didn't work for them. Then they find their way to you and me. They're broke. They not only are they often have they suffered financial consequences, but I would say more limiting for them is now they think that there's something wrong with them. Now they think, well, I guess I'm not meant to be in business because I did it the Brad way, the you know fill in the blank celebrity entrepreneur personal brand formula way. I did their formula. I followed the steps and I did the work and I didn't succeed. So therefore, I guess it means I'm not meant to live this life. That to me is so heartbreaking. And that's part of why I wanted to do this and also name some of these names as well as name I mean, the tactics and the and the the methods that have trickled down over time, because I want people to walk away with. I think what ends up happening, and I did do a whole episode of the on this with my episode of marketing muckraking. Why are there no negative B school reviews? That's a whole thing. Go listen to it after this show. But one of the effects of this kind of echo chamber and this MLM model of everyone being in somebody's downline and everyone co-signing each other's teachings is that if you go into one of those programs, or even if you're just thinking of buying one and you see all of these folks saying it worked for them and it was so great people you respect or some of your peers your friends your whatever and you see that it worked for them and not for you or you have a little spidey sense tingling saying I don't think this doesn't feel right the effect of the crowd of the echo chamber is to quiet your own inner voice and make you think well actually maybe there's something wrong with me maybe I'm the one who's wrong the biggest impact of this show is not going to be the names the impact is to help people get in touch with their own agency, to remember that they know more than they think they know, because a lot of these tactics hinge on convincing you that you don't know shit. 
when actually a lot of us actually naturally have a lot of business acumen, business is about people and serving and helping people. It's not as convoluted as some of these folks make it, but I want people to walk away feeling validated that one, my inner voice is right. I can trust my inner voice. I can trust my intuition. I can trust myself to do the research and I shouldn't be taught or training myself to just defer to what the crowd is bleeding at this particular moment. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it makes, it makes total perfect sense. And, and, you know, I used to say, and I don't anymore, I fix, there was a commercial years ago, like I fix $6 haircuts. And I was like, I fix the six figure mastermind problem, right? Like these people would come to me after that and go, the problem wasn't always that they did everything and it didn't work. Sometimes it was, I wasn't ready for a program like that. And there were all these other things I needed to do that I wasn't aware I needed to do that I wasn't ready or in a place to be able to execute on. And now I've got this half cobbled together thing and it still doesn't work for me, right? And so like you, it's about empowering and, and knowledge and allowing you to trust yourself again, because I don't want someone coming to me, beholden to me and me being their crutch for all the time and showing me, tell me what to do. I don't know. And people do, especially after they've been broke and broken through a program like that. They're so fragile and it pisses me off off because here's somebody with a really great idea or a really powerful vision and now they can't execute because they've been hamstrung by whatever investment that they made that has now left them with no viable way forward and so that just makes me angry and it doesn't have to be that way especially when you can learn how to trust your spidey senses and get away from groupthink right? Because that's mm -hmm. what it is. It's group thing. It's, oh, everybody's talking about it and everybody says it's great. And there's a whole psychological backstory to all of the third party endorsements that aren't really third party. They're friends of a friend and they're really, you know, like second party endorsements. And you're getting hypnotized and caught up in the swell of these schools coming and, oh, everybody's doing it. So you've got to go there too. And it's like, maybe you don't. Maybe you need to talk to some people and get some different information before you make a commitment like that, especially if your spidey senses are going off. Don't buy into the hype just because there's a lot of it. It does kind of feel unavoidable. Well, it is unavoidable. And one thing I want to point out is in the content I've made about this before, I've had so many people come to me and say, I'm so ashamed. I bought in. I did XYZ's thing. I'm so embarrassed. I'm so ashamed. We've all gotten got. You and me both. Like I'm a professional gotter, right? Like I've been in several of these programs that we're, you know, talking around today. And I've seen how the sausage was made. And I've seen the fallout inside the communities of those people, some of which I can talk about and some of which I can't because of NDAs, right? And you start to recognize the warning signs, but you got to get got first sometimes. And so let's help you not get got, or at least right. not get got again. Right. And this also points to the fact that both of us have a history of in earlier parts of our career, getting got and then passing the gotting along in the sense that, you know, are either of us perfect? No. Have we ourselves been ensnared in some snake oil salesman's funnel? I, yes, guilty as charged. That's number one. Number two, what we are passionate about in our work is not about ourselves, like replacing the gurus with another version of that, right? Right. right We're right. about helping our clients to find, I think, what what is your tagline right now? Finding ways to work that work for you. What is it? Yeah. Building a business that works for how you're wired to work. Because we all have different levels of capacity. About 40% of my clients have non-traditional capacity constraints. They're aging parents or chronic illnesses, or they're multiply marginalized, and they're dealing with a lot on their plate that doesn't allow them to effectively work a standard nine to five. And so you have to find ways within the system that are going to help you get to where you need to be to have a, a sense of enoughness. And I said earlier, I, I'm going to be calling out, telling on myself some here. Like I grew up with and really bought into the idea of the meritocracy. Just keep working hard, keep working harder, work harder, be the hardest worker in the room. And eventually someday you'll get there to that place where you can retire in style whenever that is. Right. And I've learned that that is not a reality, but I used to teach that. Right. And so I don't want anybody to think that. I've got it all figured out or that I am 100% like perfect, never done anything wrong. I have learned, I have improved, I've pared away. Like, I mean, we're gonna talk about Napoleon Hill. I used to teach some of that stuff because it felt like it was real and true and right when I was at that stage in my life and my business. And that's how it gets you. 
It hooks you by playing on the emotions of what you want to be right and true instead of the reality of what's really going on. And it's great marketing, terribly effective. Terribly effective. That's it. And we'll talk a little bit more about this at the end of the show, because here's what you're in for on this episode of Marketing Muckraking today. We are going to break down the online business internet marketing family tree slash poll slash circle jerk. I like that you called it that. Yes. Yes. And we're going to go back through history to understand some where some of these philosophies approaches, paradigms, funnels originated. All of the historical precedents for this have modern parallels today. So if you're like, history, no. Well, we're going to keep it modern at the same time. We're going to be ping-ponging ourselves back and forth. We're going to go through that. We're going to show how, you said it, the meritocracy, pull yourselves up by your bootstraps, prosperity, gospel, myth trickled its way into American business as a whole, and then how that turned into the principles and the approaches and the methods that then became ripe for exploitation once the internet came on the scene. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to take you all the way from Benjamin Franklin to Tony Robbins and Marie Forleo. How about them apples? And at the end of the show, we're going to talk about, all right, what do we do with this information? What are our next steps? And part of that is we're not out here to, to say, if if you have found your way in somebody's dick funnel, <laughs> that now you've got the scarlet letter on you and you can never redeem yourself or you can't change how you approach business, you know, and Lisa, I know you are a more hopeful person than me. I mean, what's your take on that side of things? Well, like I, I really want to believe that people can be redeemed, right? I mean, that's at my core years and years ago, I made a decision that people are inherently good. Like we're born inherently good. And then life happens, right? And we make choices that set us on paths that change us. And so I want to believe as much as if we can go down a path where we're being manipulative and we're doing ineffectual things that are harming our people, and we can learn from that, that we can genuinely turn over a new leaf and move in a different direction. And we deserve an opportunity to prove ourselves again under the condition of scrutiny, skepticism, not just a carte blanche. Oh, well, you got me once. Okay, we'll let you do it again. It's like, no, you got me. And if you want to keep going, you want to try again, here are the guardrails that will allow you to show up and continue to do that. When Tanya Harding bashed Nancy Kerrigan in the knee, they were like, you're not figure skating anymore, not professionally. And she's like, but that's all I know. You better figure something out. You've got a chance to redeem yourself, but not at the professional level. Go do something else. And so I want to believe that that's possible. And I recognize that some people will put on a veneer of redemption and it's just another manipulative marketing tool. And that's why I think this episode is so important because then we can start to look at, okay, they're trying to come back. Are they really though? Are they really? And now you have the tools to be able to really look at what's going on and go, yeah, they are, or mm, I'm still not sure. Is it more of the same? Because once we kind of go through, we got, we've got 10 slash 11 steps we're going to, we're going to walk through. And I think that can help to be indicators or guidelines for people to look at. If somebody, you know, <laughs> has woken up to the harms of the online business industrial complex and they're on a redemption journey, are they continuing to just regurgitate some of these 10 11 elements in different packaging or are they calling this out and, and and choosing a new way so you say this and i really want to talk about this right right at the top here because i think it's important because we've talked about you know patriarchy and different stripes and tactics and different stripes and i really want to call this out i am a mixed race person of color and i know there are a lot of people in the online space who are like, you don't call a sister out or you don't call other women out. We got to support one another. We got to lift each other up. And, and I believe in principle that that's a great idea. And my experience and my life have shown me that you can be just as harmful in heels or with darker skin as you can being a cis straight white dude, because that's where you learned it from. And until you undo that behavior, you're still just perpetuating the same harm. You just look different and that's not cool. And I really wanted to make sure we hit that right off the bat because if somebody's out there saying, you know, don't shame me into playing small, I'm gonna buy my ranch and live my life. You can go buy your ranch and live your life. I don't care, but don't go harming people in the process to do it. That's not about playing small. That's about being harmful. And that needs to stop. Yes, I'm here for it. Yes. 
With that said, I think it's time to head into the co-muckraking. And speaking of co-muckraking, we did put out a call to our audiences to get some feedback on what they hope that we're going to cover today. And some of the things that they said where we they hope we talk about overpriced masterminds, uh, the wellness industry and the toxic culty vibes that go along with it, manufactured urgency, FOMO, self-proclaimed authority. Like we're just like, yes, 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 we got this. 25K and up coaching programs, the idea that it's all about your mindset, savior complexes. And one of these things is what we were just talking about. The predation, is that the word being predatory? Predation? Yes. Okay. Lisa says yes. Yes. On people who genuinely want to learn and grow. That one really gets me because that's what we're talking about. Folks who are following these leaders, the Pied Piper of Hamlin off into no man's land, basically. And the idea that you don't invest in yourself, you must not be serious or committed. Ooh, that's a big one. And the ridiculousness of manufactured challenges. And this one is referring to the firewalks and the trust falls at Tony Robbins events and the theatrics that, you know, are marketed to gain confidence when in reality, the so-called confidence that you get walking on hot coals and doesn't translate into confidence in your next staff meeting or when you're asking for business. And Lisa, you know a little bit about some of the origins of that firewalk firewalk. Yeah. So, you know, fire walks and, you know, walking over hot coals and trust falls and and a lot of those kinds of things are actually just appropriations of cultural activities that were actually ceremonial and very significant in nature to those cultures. Right. And I don't pretend to be an expert, you know, when you're looking at Aboriginal stuff and you're, you know, you're on the island of Fiji and you see them doing this as part of some type of ceremony for the leaders of their community. You know, it's a rite of passage in their community and got a place on this island. You're like, that's really cool. I want to do that in my workshops. And the next thing you know, Tony Robbins is teaching fire walks and you can do this. Come on. And it's really easy. Watch, let me show you. Like you've just appropriated something that was very culturally significant and applied it in a completely inappropriate context as a means of indoctrination, because that's really what it is. It's an indoctrination ceremony that you've now co-opted to get people to buy into you and your cult-like tactics and your predatory behaviors. And look, I've walked across coals. Tony said I could walk across coals. I can do anything. So I'm just going to do everything he tells me to do and take my money. Oh, $100,000 for a trip to Fiji? I'm in. Where do I sign? Yeah, that to me is one of the more disgusting parts of what we're talking about here is just all of the appropriation and that is then, like you said, cultural ceremonies, sacred rituals, right? And then taken and turned into a business lesson. And in reality, with the firewalk thing, my theory about it is not only is it correct that can you parlay that into any sort of meaningful business practice? No. But you know, people who do those firewalks at the Tony events, that is just guerrilla marketing back for the event itself. Because I'm gonna go and do it. Somebody's gonna get a video. I'm gonna put it on my Instagram so I look like a badass, terribly effective, as you said. It's brilliant if you're rooting for the evil empire. But all that does is make other people give them FOMO, want them to participate. And it's just building the Tony Robbins brand. Right. Instead of actually building up the business skills of the person. So that th- that was just a short list of some of the requests that we got to take on. And so I was happy as I was walking through the list being like, okay, we are actually going to cover all the things that folks are interested in. So let's start at the top. You talked about Ben Franklin. So let's go go back to Ben, Benji, Frank and Funnel. One of the earliest mastermind-esque kinds of activities was, I think it was 1740s, somewhere in that ballpark. Ben Franklin put together a collection of people who came from different walks of life, a banker, uh, I think a historian, there there were several people, eight or nine of them. And they would get together and they would, you know, have these intellectual salons and talk about things. And that's really the first mention of anything like a mastermind in American history. But the mastermind as we know it now and what it's devolved into in the internet marketing space really came out of the early 20th century. And it was built from two things that kind of happened at roughly the same time. One of those was Henry Ford's Vagabonds. So this was the little quote unquote mastermind group with Edison and Ford and Firestone and John Burroughs. And then later 
several presidents. And, you know, every year it started, they were going camping, they were hanging out and talking shop and, you know, letting their minds wander and they'd come back refreshed and what have you. But then other people started showing up and they always had servants with them. So they were really glamping out there, let's be clear. And, you know, then more people started coming and then the wives started coming and the presidents started coming and the media started coming. And by 1925, Napoleon Hill had written his book, Think and Grow Rich, which was actually an extract of an earlier work, The Law of Success in 16 Lessons. Most people don't realize it's basically the Reader's Digest condensed version of this long set of books that he had previously written. And in it, he talks about how it's well known that Henry Ford built this mastermind and they worked together and, you know, they created this thing. And so you get this zeitgeist from Think and Grow Rich, which a lot of the early internet marketers were just gung-ho hooked on, right? Still are, Lisa. Still are, They're right. Still citing this book. Yeah, because they don't fact check, right? Think and Grow Rich is still on Target shelves today. So yeah. Do you want to know the funny thing? As I was researching, Napoleon Hill actually saw Henry Ford in a bookshop not long after the book came out. And he was like, I would love it if you would read my book. And Ford looked at the cover and was like, did you come here in a bus or a car? And he's like, well, I took the bus. He's like, well, until you can come in your own car, I'm not reading your book. Because look, this is my car. I didn't think and I grew rich. So your book is not the way. Like he said that. And nobody talks about that, right? And it's like the dollop did a whole podcast on Napoleon Hill, the shyster. He didn't interview these people. Like, but again, I taught this in my early days because we didn't have Google to fact check back then. Mm -hmm. Like we didn't have that. And so there are some things from that book that can be valuable, can be useful, but it's all predicated on this prosperity gospel, lift yourself up by the bootstraps, think positively, you know, point your dreams and desires in a given direction and it's bound to happen for you like magic. And it's like, mm, that doesn't work for everybody. Some people are more equal than others and those people are going to have those kinds of experiences more frequently than the rest of us, right? And we need to be honest about that. Yes, this is it. So this is the foundation. And actually I'm going to rewind a little bit. So we started with Ben Franklin because you threw out that Ben Franklin reference. And I was like, wait a minute. Benjamin Franklin's Farmer's Almanac was actually one of the earliest records of advertising in the media in the United States of America was he had his own advertisements that he would place in his almanacs. So I'm always you know, interested in the Ben Franklin reference. But where we kind of start the journey before we even get to the masterminds really is with what you just said. The prosperity gospel, myth of the meritocracy, pull yourselves up by your bootstraps, dream. The American dream. Really became popularized at the turn of the 20th century, kind of coming off of the industrial revolution, the machine age, and going into this gilded age over into the 20th century. There is a perception, a misperception that the pull yourselves up by your bootstraps, prosperity gospel mindset started with the beginning of the, of the founding of the country. And that is not entirely true because it really came with the mass production economy and the need to sell people into the ethos of buying their way to a better life. Because actually like the, the early Puritan Protestant philosophy was not prosperity gospel, was not think and grow rich, but was actually the more you suffer, the closer you are to God. Because the early US economy, the early, even before it was the United States of America, was an agrarian society, right? People were, were farming, they were living off of the land. There weren't cities yet. They were far away from each other. People weren't going to the store to buy everything that they needed. They were making their own things. They were trading with each other. They were holding on to, to their possessions and taking care of them. And then with the Industrial Revolution and the advent of the mass production economy in the United States was the first economy to be based off of mass production. And then it spread throughout the rest of the world. I'm not saying that there wasn't mass production elsewhere, but the U.S. was the first mass production centered economy coming into the 20th century. Once that happened, all these capitalists have these factories and they're producing items at a breakneck pace. Well, in order for them to actually get their money back, in order for them to be profitable, being able to churn thousands of items off of a line in an hour versus over days or weeks, they had to get people used to buying all the time, buying them their way to comfort. So then there became this shift 
effect in preachers and the ministers who were preaching the gospel started to adjust their messages instead of saying, oh, the more you suffer, the closer you are to God. The message became this prosperity gospel message of the more God wants you to be wealthy. And if you are, God has ordained it so, that kind of like manifest destiny yeah. ideology. So we start the bullshit that we are experiencing today and has trickled down over a hundred years. We started with this pull yourself up by your bootstraps, prosperity gospel, myth of meritocracy. That was the beginning of it. And that is what made it possible for Ford and Firestone to even have, who even cares if those guys are hanging out in the woods together? Well, we care because they were the early capitalist tycoons of of the mass production economy. They had found their invention, right? And they were these quote unquote captains of industry who, let's be clear, were incredibly racist, very exploitative. That's the whole reason we have unions, right? Is because of that whole energy of, you can work all day until the sun goes down and, oh, your arm got broken, sorry, keep working, right? Like that whole energy of, what matters is how much we produce so that more people can consume so that we can produce more so that you still have a job. This self-perpetuating circle of exploitation is what allowed them to rise to the level of now we can go camp out in the woods for a week and talk shop and strategize how we're going to influence the government by having the president come camp with us and all that. Here's a tip. Black dudes were not doing that at that time. That was not an option. Like we were lucky if we could get a table, a seat at the counter, right? Like Jim Crow was still very much a real thing. So masterminds, and I love the idea and really buy into still the idea of a rising tide lifts all boats, but you got to get your boat in the water, right? If your boat ain't in that water, your ship can't rise. And so this mastermind construct that has then been co-opted and usurped and implanted into the internet marketing age becomes this clicky way for people with money and influence and power to hang out with one another. And the whole place where I learned that this really got its kind of groundswell were from some of the people that I had learned it from was who was their teacher. And there was a guy named Dan Kennedy who was a master direct male copyright, masterful for better or worse, very good at what he did. And Yannick Silver was one of the guys who studied from him and said, I'm going to take these ideas and I'm going to use them in the internet marketing world because he was a young gun in the online world. And that's why the early sales letters had all the yellow highlighter and the flashing by nows and all of that really stuff that we look at now and go, Bleh. but that's where he learned it from, direct male copywriting from Dan Kennedy. Well, Dan Clint Kennedy and Bill Glazer had the Glazer Kennedy Insider Circle, which I think is now owned by Russ Brunson or something. You're going to talk about that. If you're here for ClickFunnels. And at that, at those meetings, you know, these people would come and learn these great copywriting techniques and they would, you know, rub elbows with one another. And, oh, hey, you've got a program that you're doing. I've got a program that I'm doing. Why don't you and I get together and like promote that? And so that starts to lead us to the JV. But before we go there, people that were at this meeting or at these meetings were like, hey, we could really make some money if we offered this ourselves. And that's where you started to see these five and six figure masterminds starting to develop in the early 2000s for these internet marketing communities. Yannick Silver had his, his 10X, the Maverick Adventure Mastermind or whatever. Marie Forleo had an adventure mastermind and she ended up pulling most of the good content out of that and turning it into B-School. Rich, happy, and hot, right? Wasn't rich, that how rich, it happy, and hot was the B-School, yes. So all these people are kind of coming up at the same time. And Allie Brown had this diamond level mastermind. It was like $100,000 a year. And you know, I know several people who were in it and were like, wow, this is really, this is what I paid for? You know, kind of a thing. And so you start to see all of these people popping up with these mastermind groups. But in order to populate those mastermind groups, they've now got to rely on each other to help cross-pollinate and cross-market. And that's where we get into this whole JV situation, right? Affiliate marketing and JV re relationships and the JV leaderboards. There was, I was talking with someone who asked to remain anonymous. So I'm going to honor that because she's a very good person. She has worked inside several of these internet marketing empires, if you will. And at one time, one JV leader was giving away a car to the top leader, the top referral person for their program. They won that car and then they chose to give that car for their affiliate thing. And so they were, there was like seven or eight of these guys just passing this car around because nobody wanted to pay the taxes on receiving this prize, right? So what you're saying is somebody said, 
I'm going to give away a car for whoever's at the top of my leaderboard. Mm -hmm. And then that person won the car and they were like, I don't want to pay taxes on it. So I'm going to give away this car. If you get on my leaderboard and then whoever won that car from the, it just was like, yeah, it was just this continuous circle of let's keep giving away the same prizes. And the same people were showing up to promote those things. Right. And so what happened to that car, Lisa? I want to know, where did the car end up? Is the car a muckraker now? Is the car burning shit down? I don't know. I don't know. The car turned into Carrie. Like, isn't that what, no, not Carrie. What's that Christine, the Stephen King, where the car rises up and says, I'm done with y'all, right? That's funny. So we started with prosperity gospel, meritocracy, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, which comes out of the mass production economy, which is what made Henry Ford and Firestone and all those other guys wealthy and influential enough for them to even know who each other was to then go out glamping together in the wilderness to trade secrets amongst the muskrats. All right. So that was the early masterminds. And we brought up Napoleon Hill and you said the dollop did a great breakdown on all of his BS. I've got two episodes of marketing muckraking pulling apart Think and Grow Rich and why it's so problematic. And what I think is most important to note here about Napoleon Hill is that one thing is he tried to imply to his audience and in some cases outright said that he was a part of those masterminds. So he was trying to get that like power through proximity. He was trying to leverage the personal brands of the folks who are glamping with the muskrats and the millions. And and no way to fact check back then, right? No way to fact check. He was full of crap and he just literally went town to town lying to people about his, what was so wild about Napoleon Hill was in a way he did fulfill fill his own bullshit philosophy because he went around thinking, how can I get rich, make myself look like I'm connected to rich, powerful people, even though I'm not. And that is what made him rich. The perception he was more successful than he was. So ultimately it was a self-fulfilling prophecy, the whole fake it till you make it. Right. And this is why the whole, the problem is your mindset problem exists. Right. Right. Like this is the whole, well, the reason you're not successful is because you don't want it enough. You haven't focused your desire enough. You haven't strived enough. You aren't enough. And that's why you're failing. It's all between your ears. And I'll be the first one to say, sometimes mindset does make a difference because if you don't believe something is possible for yourself, you're really not going to step in that direction. And I have a lot of clients who come to me in this state of quasi defeat where they've been burned or they've, they've been hobbling along in their business for a while. And they're like, I don't understand why it's not working. And it's like, okay, well, do you even believe that this is possible? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, well, there's, there's your first problem. Like we've got to get over that hump. So sometimes there is a mindset component, but the mindset is not the whole issue. And I, and I really want to be clear on that because the mechanics are important too. The mastery is important too. Like you got to know what you're doing. You got to know how to do it. You got to be competent at it. Right. And then the mindset piece makes a difference. But if you're selling schlock, no amount of mindset's going to make that goal. It's just not. And that's the problem with so many of these. Now that masterminds have trickled down from Henry Ford to Dick Funnels, is that what they are teaching is mindset with like 1% teaching people to become masters of their craft, teaching people to be... I don't even think they're teaching that though, Rachel, honestly, because here's the thing, right? They're teaching coaches, teaching coaches how to coach, right? No. What's happening is they're marketing people, teaching coaches how to market, not how to be a better coach, not, not how to, not how to get more people to completion. And you and I were talking about this earlier. They don't know instructional design. They don't understand. They're just like, you just need to sell a course. And my course on teaching you how to sell a course is going to help you sell a course. Well, I can sell a course, but if people don't get what they need out of it, if they don't complete that course, I don't get great reviews. I don't sell more of them. I don't stay in business, but you don't teach me that piece. Oh, no, 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 no. We just teach you how to market it. We just teach you how to use Canva to make it look pretty. Like we just teach you the t- the fluffy top stuff. And in internet marketing for a very long time, there has been this notion of teach the what and the why, but not the how, especially in a, in a, a sales webinar. Teach them why it's important that they learn this. Teach them what they need to do, but don't give them the exact steps or teach them the how of getting the thing happening because then they'll pay to enroll in your program. And then you can teach them part of the how in the first program and more of the how in the next program. And then more of the how, but not really the defining factor pieces at that top level, year long, intensive, six figure, buy my thing group. 
that promises a lot of access and then doesn't deliver. And one of the pieces that we're highlighting here, this is why this show is called Marketing Muckraking. Because as much as I am talking about online business, these folks from the Napoleon Hills all the way to the Forleos, the Dick Funnels, the Robins, the fill in the blanks, aren't teaching business, they're teaching marketing. And they're really teaching the marketing of the self because what they yes. end up teaching more than the mechanics of how to build a business or how to teach or how to lead, how to get people to the finish line. They're teaching people how to artificially inflate the perceived value of your brand, of your personal brand, so that you can get people into a room to pay you $100,000 to get a tiny little taste of the how, right? It's not about how do you get them, uh, how do you really help all different types of people from walks, different walks of life, from different learning capacities, from different economic ex- situations? How do you help all of those types of people achieve success or achieve their enoughness, as you said earlier, which is brilliant? It's about how do you get them in the room? How do you make them pay any price to be there? Because you're worth it, right? That is what they're teaching. So going all the way back, we got prosperity gospel into masterminds. We got Napoleon Hill piggybacking off of these masterminds to make him his own self rich. And then like you said, even think and grow rich is a synthesis, a dumbed down synthesis of his own archive of bullshit, right? And he was able to become wealthy, not because he knew how to actually help people become rich, but because he knew how to make people think he knew how to make them become rich. So it really is kind of like think and grow. Think that I will grow rich and I will grow rich. You, I don't know. There's an old cartoon that I remember from the comic strips years ago, and it was just two frames and it was the cover of a book, How to Make a Million Dollars with a price tag of a million dollars on it, right? Like, yeah, you too can make a million dollars. Just, you know, give me a million dollars and I'll show you how to do the same thing. That's that whole, if I can do it, you can too thing. And you and I have gone round and round about this in several conversations. You know, I I watch the ebb and flow, the rise and fall of internet marketers. I've been online almost 30 years, right? I've been a coach for just about 20. I've seen a lot. I've done a lot. I've had my hands inside a lot of people's businesses. And the one thing that I see time and again is this rapid rise trajectory in the first year or two of of being visible in an online space, right? And then I'm going to teach you how to make six figures in six minutes or six weeks or six months. And if I can do it, you can too. Okay, I'm interested. Show me. And okay, so here's what you got to do. So I had this credit card with a $10,000 credit card limit and I ran Facebook ads and maxed out my card and I spent enough money on ads to sell enough people into my program and paid off my credit card. But my cousin is really good with Facebook ads and he helped me optimize and maximize my ads. So I'm going to teach you some of the tricks that he taught me and that's how you can go make six figures in six minutes too. And so they rise and they, they sell the hell out of this thing and then it doesn't get the results. And so they start to try and sell some other stuff that gets some results, but less and less and less. And they're finding that they're having to work harder and harder and harder to make money because they haven't really built a solid business model, right? They've been relying on the cachet of who they are or their quote unquote success and their list is getting burned out and they're getting tired. And then by about year three or four, you see people who are like, I am so burned out. I need to take some time off or worse, real physical, you know, like adrenal fatigue right? Because they've hustled so hard and they've worked so hard. And they're like, you know, I'm, I'm done. I'm, I'm bowing out of this internet marketing game. I'm going to go get a real job, quote unquote, a real job. Like this is a real job too, but I'm going to go work in corporate. I'm going to go work for my family. I'm going to like leave all this behind. And the, the number, the trail of bodies that they leave in their wake is devastating because then there are folks like you and me are here to try and pick up the pieces and help these people recognize, as you said, right at the top, that you're not broken. This isn't you. This is a problem inherent in the system that needs to change. So they faked it. They made it. They made the money. They faked Uh knowing what the hell they were doing. They made the money. And then they took that money and ran off into the wilderness because actually they don't have any, they don't know how to teach you how to do it because they themselves kind of just stumbled around. What you also nod to here is the privilege of having a card with a $10,000 credit limit on it that you can max out, which is not available to everyone. The, the connections to the cousin who does Facebook ads or the the folks that are a few steps ahead of you and are willing to give you a hand up because maybe your name can help boost their name 
while you're boosting their name, you're there, you know, it's going around in yep. circles. So it's all very, very specific to the experience of the person who does the teaching and then scales that into I did it and you can too. And this all goes back to the think and grow rich mindset myth that all you need to do is be in the right headspace. Yes, that's an element of it. But most of these people are selling that as, you know, it's 99% mindset, 1% practical value. And this also sinks back to what I was talking about this turn of the century transition into the prosperity gospel meritocracy myth. Around that same time, a phenomenon that was coming up was, was this thing called mind cure culture that really became popularized in like the 1910s, 1920s. And it was, it sinks right up to the mass production economy needing to retrain us to become buyers, to become frequent buyers. The idea that instead of looking outward and instead of being part of a community in a collective, we should look inward and buy our way to inner peace and happiness. And this is where the advent of kind of our modern toxic wellness culture comes from. Yeah. It's not about looking at how do we make the world better for all of us? That is actually going to be the rising tide that lifts all boats. It's like, no, you are damaged. Something is wrong with your mindset, with your way of thinking here by this soap or by this book or by this thing, this external thing that's going to help you get right with yourself. Because it's not about us and our systemic barriers and challenges. It's about the fact that you just need a little like chakra realignment, or you need to buy your way. You just need to think and grow rich. Is this making sense? Right. This is a really slippery slope because this is also part of that mindset of get yourself right and you can help the world, right? Like fix you and then you can go you know, put your own oxygen mask on First. And there's there's some helpful truth in that. And that that's the that's what's so insidious about this. There's some helpful truth in a lot of it. And you've got to be aware of what is the wheat and what is the chaff. And you know, all of this mindset stuff. And I'm like, but but Thomas Edison himself said genius is one percent inspiration. That's the mindset piece. And 99% perspiration. That's getting your ass up and doing the work, right? Like, so yes, mindset is a component. But it's not the be all and the end all that so many of these people want to lead you to believe that it is because that's the thing that they can have the most impact on is playing with your head. This concludes part one of the online business family tree. We're just getting warmed up here, folks. Join us for parts two, three, and four, where we'll go from Six Figure Masterminds, Marie Forleo and The Syndicate, to Jenna Kutcher, Rachel Hollis, and the curious case of the SEO optimized friendship, the appalling truth behind ClickFunnels, Brooke Castillo and the Life Coach School, and much more. Plus, Lisa and I share our thoughts on what to do with this information and how to do business better in a world of snake oil. See you in part two. If you want more marketing muckraking and brand strategy gone wild, I invite you to subscribe to this show. And if you enjoyed it, leave me a review. That really helps me out. If you hated it, please send it to your enemies. They sound like good people. You can go to rachelkalbers.com slash subscribe to get these updates in your inbox. And because this show is self-sponsored, if you wanted to support my work, you can go to buymearobe.com. That's where the magic happens. In the meantime, remember, it's not the age of the niche. It's the age of the wildcard bitch. See you on the internet. Oh, 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 oh,